Several weeks ago, I began a new series on the subject of the armor of God. And in the first week of the series, I talked about the importance of putting on the armor of God. In the second week, I explained how to put on the armor of God. And if you weren't here, you really need to go back and watch that sermon. And you can do that on our website. Because every Christian needs to know how to put on the armor of God so that they can stand against the wiles of the devil. Why? Because the devil is wily. So you need to be able to put on the whole armor of God. And most people don't know how to do that. So I spent the entire sermon explaining how to do that. This week, we're going to start studying each individual piece of the armor. So if you would, turn with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verse number 11. We've read this passage of scripture, not only in this series, but also in the last series, the series on angels and demons. Notice what it says. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now I want you to notice that this says to put on the whole armor of God, not just a few pieces of armor. In other words, it's not enough to have a sword and a shield if you want to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, then you have to put on the whole armor of God. Anything less than that will make you vulnerable to the enemy. And that's why many Christians have fallen, including leaders. They didn't put on the whole armor of God. And the devil was able to take advantage of that. Most of you are being taken advantage of. But the reason you're being taken advantage of is because you've not put on the whole armor of God. Now, according to Paul, the armor of God consists of six different pieces. The loin belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. Those are the six pieces that make up the whole armor of God. And they're, very, and they're the very same pieces that a Roman soldier wore. In fact, as many times as Paul was imprisoned, I'm sure that he was very familiar with the armor of a Roman soldier. And that's probably what he thought of while he was writing this passage of Scripture. So as we study each piece of armor, I'll be comparing it to the armor of a Roman soldier at the time of Paul. So that you can understand not only the importance of each piece, but also the function. Each piece of armor has a specific function. And if you don't have that piece on, then you're not going to be able to function properly. And that's why we're going to be comparing it to the armor of a Roman soldier. Now this morning, we're going to start with the very first piece of armor that's listed in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 17. And that's the loin belt of truth. So if you would, turn with me to the, the book of Ephesians chapter 6. We're in the same chapter, but we're going to jump down two verses. We're going to start in verse 13 and read to verse 17. And just follow along with me as I read this. Therefore, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand. You've got to be able to withstand these attacks in the evil day. And having done all to stand. In other words, to keep standing. When it's finished you want to be the one that's still standing. How many of you have gone through a tough time and you say, well, I'm still standing? That's what this is saying. So that you may be able to withstand not only the attacks of the devil, but also when you've done all that you can, you're still standing. Then he goes further. Stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God now when it says which is the word of God notice it's the sword of the spirit this is not the Bible it's talking about that word word is translated from the from the Greek word rhema and it's talking about a word that God speaks to you as you're reading the logos the Bible and God speaks something to you in other words it comes alive to you that's a rhema that's what that's referring to. Now, of the six pieces of armor that's listed in this passage of Scripture, some are more important than others. But don't misunderstand me. They're all very important, but some are more important than others. And believe it or not, the loin belt of truth is one of the most important, if not the most important. Though most people would never guess that because it's so inconspicuous. In other words, every other piece of armor would draw your attention long before you ever noticed the loin belt. You see, the helmet was majestic. And that's because Rome allowed their soldiers to accessorize their helmets in any way that they wanted to, just as long 
as it didn't diminish the structural integrity of the helmet and its ability to protect the soldiers. So most helmets were decorated with a plume of colored feathers or maybe with horse hair that was dyed in some brilliant color. In fact, it was kind of like our Air Force pilots today. How many of you watched the movie Top Gun? That's an old movie, isn't it? You know, I can remember when that came out and that was just so good. And the other day I watched it again and it's like, oh man, that's kind of cheesy. But anyways, if you watch Top Gun, you know there was Maverick and there was Goose and there was the Iceman. But if you notice their helmets, they were different colors. They had different words on them. There was also stickers and they painted them. You want to know why the Air Force allowed them to do that? The Air Force allows them to do that, number one, because they're in the aircraft and no one else sees them and you can tell by the aircraft that it's on your team but the other reason is because their history goes all the way back to the Roman Empire and based on the Roman Empire they said we want to allow our pilots to decorate or accessorize their helmets in any way they want to as long as it doesn't compromise the structural integrity of the helmet and or uh, diminishes its ability to protect them so you couldn't help but notice their helmets because when you looked at it, you wanted to know, well, how did they decorate their helmet? The breastplate for an infantryman was also, or was what we would call a coat of mail. It went from the soldier's neck all the way down to the top of their knee, and it was kind of like a dress. But it was made out of brass, and the more that a soldier wore it, the shinier it, shinier it became because the small scale-like pieces of metal would rub against each other causing it to polish itself. So it would literally begin to shine, especially when the sun hit it. So you couldn't help but notice it. In fact, let me give you a little fun fact about the Roman Empire. This is interesting. Most people don't know this, but if you go back and you study ancient war, wars and ancient armies, what you'll find at find is that part of the strategy was that you wanted your army to be positioned in such a way that when you went into battle, the sun was behind you. Because you didn't want the sun in your soldier's eyes. You wanted the sun in the eyes of your opponent. But Rome was totally different. And the reason Rome was totally different is because their helmet actually had a visor on it. How many of you remember what a, what a helmet looked like for a Roman soldier? If you remember, it has a visor, kind of like a baseball hat. And the purpose of that visor was so that their soldiers could fight facing the sun. But the other reason they wanted that is because when the sun would shine, their infantry, their infantry wore this coat of mail. And all of these small pieces of metal would rub against each other. And the more it rubbed against each other, the shinier it became. And it would literally, when the sun hit it, it would shine and it would dazzle you. And it would blind the enemy. I mean, you would go up to fight against them. And it was almost like, man, this is unbelievable. Shining in your eyes like that. So Rome was probably the only army that actually wanted to fight facing the sun but the reason they wanted to was because of the breastplate the next thing that would catch your eye was the soldier's shield now a roman soldier had two shields one for battle that was called a thurios the other was for public parades or ceremonies and it was called an aspis so in essence one was for show the other was for combat the one Paul is referring to, and this is the one for combat. It was composed of six layers of animal hide, specially tanned to be as strong as steel, but to be as light as possible. And then you had the soldier's sword. The sword always caught the eye of a civilian. And here's what's interesting. The reason it caught your eye is because it wasn't huge, it wasn't big. It was actually just 19 inches long, but it was a two-edged sword. And it was razor sharp on both sides. Now, this is kind of interesting because when we picture a sword, we picture a big sword, right? We see these guys holding swords and they have both hands on them and that's how the crusader swords were. Or maybe we see the Muslims and what they had was a scimitar. And they actually had this long sword. And so we think of swords as being long. Or maybe we go back to the time of the French, maybe the 15th and 16th century, and those long, thin swords. And they would put their arm up and they would fight like this, right? Romans didn't fight that way. Romans wanted to have hand-to-hand -hand combat. In fact, you would take your shield and you would hit the other person and you always wanted to maintain contact just like an offensive lineman. You didn't ever let it be any space between you. And the reason you did that is because their sword was long. And when you're up against them, 
They can't use their sword to stab you and they can't swing to hit you. So it was useless. So what a Roman soldier did is he came up and he put it on and all he would do is pivot. He'd hit them with that shoulder and then he'd pivot and stab. Hit them with the shoulder, pivot and stab. So the sword was only 19 inches long. But it was strong as could be and it was razor sharp on both sides. And you couldn't help but notice the soldier's shoes. Because they were like steel baseball cleats. Except these cleats were one to three inches long. They also wore a greave that was considered to be a part of their shoe. It was made from brass and went from the top of their knees to the top of their feet. Now, with all of these impressive pieces of armor, hardly anyone ever noticed the loin belt. But even though it wasn't something a person would notice, it was one of the most important pieces of a soldier's armor, if not the most important piece. You see, the loin belt held the three major, major pieces of armor together. In fact, the loin belt is what kept the breastplate from flapping when you ran and coming back from slapping you with each step. Because the breastplate was made like a poncho. It was a long coat of mail with a slit in the middle for the head. And you would put it on just like a poncho. In fact, let me use this as an example. I didn't have time. Actually, I looked online for a coat of mail. And you can't find that. Can you believe that? I guess there's no use for that anymore. So what I did was I took an old tablecloth and I cut it up. But I want you to understand that if you were called to be in the army, and here's how the Roman army worked. When they defeated another nation, then you were required, based upon the population of your nature, nation, to provide so many soldiers. Now, they wouldn't allow those soldiers to serve in their own land. They would make up a legion, and they would put them in another land. In fact, many times they would put you in the land of your enemies. But the reason they did that is because they didn't want to, to create this legion of soldiers and they're in their own nation. And then they turn around and they rebel against Rome. But what Rome would do is he would, they would take all of the men who were fighting age from the nation that they had conquered and they would come in and they would draft so many of them and say, you're going to be a soldier. So when you pulled up... And you went to the place you were supposed to be and you came out and said, okay, I'm supposed to be a soldier. The first thing they did was they measured you. They measured the top of your shoulder all the way to the top of your knees. And then they would measure your shoulders. And then they would measure your waist. And based on that, they would get you a coat of mail. And it would be shaped like a rectangle, just like this, with a slit in the middle for your head. And you would put it on just like a poncho. You would come in and you would... Slip it over yourself just like that. But it wouldn't stay in place without the loin belt. So what you did, do you guys like my coat of mail? You would have a loin belt and you would put the loin belt over it just like this. And you would come in and snap it. Actually, it, was made, it wasn't actually a snap. There was a latch to it. But you would take the front and the back and the front would actually attach itself to the loin belt and so would the back, and that's what kept it in place. The loin belt was also used to attach the scabbard for your sword because you didn't want to walk around all the time with your sword in your hand, right? No. You know, you get your sword and you're not like you're walking around and everywhere you're talking to someone and you go for groceries and you stab it and put it in your back. No, you didn't do that. When you weren't using your sword, you put it in its scabbard. But you wanted to be able to get to it, so the scabbard was attached to the loin belt. It was also where you put your shield. Because there was a clip on the loin belt that you could hang your shield on. And if you want to get technical, you actually had this clip on both sides of the loin belt. And I'll explain why in just a minute. So as you can see, the loin belt was a very important piece of equipment. It held everything together with the exception of the helmet and the shoes. It held the breastplate in place. It also held the sword and the shield. Plus, it served the same function as an athletic cup for soldiers. I mean, you know the importance of an athletic cup, right? I want you to understand, this is not a loin belt. If it was a loin belt, and you've seen this before, there would be these strips of leather that comes about right here, and it would go down to about this point, and they're attached together. And what most people don't know, right where the man's genitals is, there's also a piece of metal right behind that. That was your athletic cup. So it was one of the most important pieces of armor, if not the most important. Now, the same thing holds true for the armor of God. 
The loin belt is one of the most important pieces of armor, if not the most important. In fact, I believe that it is the most important. Now turn back to Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 14, and I'll show you why I believe that. And yes, I'm going to preach with this on because I have some illustrations with it. So I know it looks real cool, but let's keep going. Notice what it says, verse 14. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. Do you see that? You're to gird your loins with truth. And that's why it's called the loin belt of truth. But what is truth? Well, Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse number 17, that God's word is truth. So the loin belt is God's word. Yeah. And people, it's what holds the breastplate of righteousness in place. And it's also what holds the sword of the Spirit until it's ready for use. And the shield of faith when the battle became fierce. Now let me explain how a Roman soldier would clip their shield to the loin belt. If they were in a public parade or if they were in a ceremony or if you were guarding a prisoner or if you were in town and you really didn't think there would be a battle, you just needed your presence to be known. If you're right-handed, your scabbard was attached to the left side of your loin belt. On the right side was also a little clip. So if you had an aspis because you're not going into battle, you didn't have a thurios, the big one for combat. You had the one for show. It's called an aspis. You had a place that you slipped your forearm through and then you would grab hold of it. This place where you had your forearm was quite long. It was about six to eight inches long. And on it was a little place where you could attach it to the loin belt. The reason you did that is because if you're standing in place, it doesn't matter if it only weighs 15 pounds. How many of you have ever tried to just lug 15 pounds around all day? You didn't want to do that. So you would attach it to your loin belt. Now here's the great thing about the loin belt. Because the breastplate is attached to it, it's kind of like suspenders. So when you put the shield to it, you don't have to worry about the loin belt working its way down. And the reason you don't is because the breastplate is attached to it and it goes around your shoulders so your shoulders is holding all the weight. So you could stand for 8, 10, 11 hours a day with your shield standing right there against it because the loin belt or your shoulders is carrying it. Now if you were going into battle, you didn't use an aspis, you used a thurios. It was long and rectangular and it was much heavier. If you were right-handed, the scabbard was on your left side because you wanted to be able to grab it easy. You didn't want to have to do this and pull it up. You did this and you pulled it out. So you actually had on the left side on the scabbard was also another clip for your sword or for your shield. So what you would do is once you had your thurios in your right hand, if you're right-handed, when you get ready to go into battle, you switch it to your left hand. You pull out your sword and then you attach it to that clip. When you get ready to run, you run into battle and then you throw it up and it's a tall shield and you throw your shoulder into it just like a football player and you want to knock them off balance. And then when they get their balance, you keep on till you're always making contact and then you pivot and stab, pivot and stab. But you're not having to hold it up. Your loin belt is doing all of the work. So listen to me. Without the loin belt, there would be no place to hang your sword or your shield or to keep your breastplate from flapping as you ran. And that's why it's the very first piece of equipment that Paul mentions in this list. Without it, people, you're in trouble. In fact, this is the only piece of armor that has taken a physical form. Yeah. Every other piece of God's armor is spiritual. In other words, you cannot see it. You might be here today. And I can't tell whether you have on the breastplate or not because I don't know whether you're righteous or not. Just because you come to church doesn't mean you're righteous. I can't tell whether or not you have faith. So I don't know whether you have the shield of faith. I can't see your faith. You can tell me you have faith all day long. Now I know James says, you say you have faith. Show me your faith. I'll show you my faith by my works. Now, I can look at your works, but sometimes you can even just do a show. So I don't know whether you really have faith. I don't know whether or not you really received a rhema from God. So I don't know whether you have the sword. But there is one piece of armor that we can actually physically see. And it's tangible and visible to the eye. And people, that is the loin belt. Because it's the loin belt of truth, which is the word of God. It has been written down for us. You see, the Word of God is so important and so valuable that God allowed His divine Word to actually pass from the spiritual realm into this physical realm. And now we can hold our hands on it. And it's this, the Bible. Now, listen to me because this is very important. 
Just as the loin belt was placed in the midsection or the center of a soldier's body. This is the midsection, right? Some of you have a problem with your midsection. I have a problem with my midsection. It's bigger than my chest. I have a furniture disease. My chest is sunk down into my drawers. But anyways, <laughs> this is the midsection. This is the center. But the loin belt holds everything together, the major pieces. It holds the breastplate in, in place. It holds the scabbard for the sword of the spirit. It holds the shield when I'm in battle. But here's the thing that you need to understand. Just as that is placed on the Roman soldier in the midsection or the center of his body, the word of God must also be placed in the center of your life and given a dominant role in order to hold all the different facets of your life together. In fact, let me ask you a question. How many of you feel like you just don't have it all together? Anyone ever made that comment? I just feel like I don't have it all together. Well, do you want to know why you feel that way? You feel that way because God's word is not in the center of your life. And you're not allowing it to play the dominant role that it's supposed to. If you would do that, everything in your life would come together and be held in place. In fact, the more you grow as a Christian, the more you understand God's word, the more you understand your role as a husband and as a father, the more you understand your role as a child of God and as an employer or employee, all the decisions begin to be made for you and your life begins to come together. You know how to balance work with family. You know how to balance all of these different things that you do. Everything that you don't feel like you have together starts coming together when the word of God becomes the center of your life and it plays the dominant role that it's supposed to. In fact, let me show you something interesting. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. I love this passage of scripture, but it explains why some of you, your life is a train wreck. Listen to what it says. For when, for the time, you ought to be teachers. And if you're a parent, you should be a teacher because your child is the pupil in your home and you're the teacher. But it says, for when, for the time, you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become as such that have need of milk and not of strong meat. Now this is where it gets good. Notice this. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Now do you see what verse 13 is saying? It's saying that everyone that's not into the meat of God's word but is on the milk of God's word, is unskillful in the word of righteousness. In other words, when you don't know the word of God, you lack a basic understanding of what righteousness is all about. You're an immature babe. And that's why you're doing the things you shouldn't be doing, and you're not doing the things you should be doing. It's because you're not digging into the meat of God's word. You're still on milk. Romans chapter 12 tells us not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we might be able to prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That's a horrible translation. That word prove is translated from the Greek word diakrino, and it means to make a distinction. You should be able to, when you become mature and you get in the meat of the word, you should be able to tell the difference between, you should be able to make a distinction between the acceptable will of God, the good will of God, and the perfect will of God. But you didn't know how to make a distinction. You didn't know how to distinguish between God's acceptable will. Oh, they're a Christian. You know, God says, don't marry anyone that's not a Christian. So they're a Christian. That's God's acceptable will. What's his good will? His good will is that it's someone who loves him like Christ loves and loves their spouse like Christ loves the church. But it doesn't mean that they're the perfect will. The perfect will is someone who exhibits the fruit of the Spirit and the characteristics of love. But the reason you didn't know or you didn't have the ability to make a distinction between the acceptable will, the good will, and the perfect will is because you're on the milk of God's word. You're not in the meat. Everyone with me? That's good teaching, Pastor Allen. Now, since we're talking about righteousness, let's talk about the relationship between the loin belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. As I told you, the loin belt was designed to hold the breastplate in position by attaching the front and the back of it to the belt. 
Now, without the loin belt, the breastplate would flap when you ran, and it would go from side to side as you were coming in and you were fighting the enemy, and it would also cause you to become very clumsy and leave you open. Let's just take the loin belt off, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. If you started to run without the loin belt, this thing would flap and come back and slap you, and then if you had to go to one side or the other, it's leaving you very vulnerable. But not only that, because it's heavy, I'm here to tell you, It's going to throw you off balance. So in order for you to have this breastplate on right, you've got to have a loin belt. And then that that breastplate has to be attached to it. Everyone with me? So there is a spiritual analogy here that I want to show you. And this is the spiritual analogy. If you're taking notes, write this down. If you have your phone, take a picture of this. Here it is. Just as the loin belt kept the breastplate properly wrapped around the soldier, the word of God keeps you properly wrapped in righteousness. Let me say that again, and then I'll explain what it means. Just as the loin belt kept the breastplate properly wrapped around the soldier, this isn't properly wrapped, and the reason it's not, it literally would need to be attached, the front and the back, to the loin belt, and it would keep it in place. But just as the loin belt kept the breastplate properly wrapped around a soldier, the Word of God keeps you properly wrapped in righteousness. You see, the loin belt went over the breastplate, and you couldn't take off the breastplate until you took off the loin belt. In other words, it's impossible to take off the breastplate as long as the loin belt is still on. And the same holds true in the spiritual realm. As long as you're walking in the word of God and you're doing what it says, you remain clothed in the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And you don't have to worry about whether you're clothed in righteousness or not. It can't come off because the word of God keeps it on. It, it's only when you stop walking in the word of God and doing what it says that the loin belt comes off because it's the word of God and you stop doing it. And now when you stop doing that, you start doing things you shouldn't. And guess what? The breastplate comes off. Now, that brings us to the next piece of armor that we want to study. It's the second on the list, and it's the breastplate of righteousness. So turn back to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the breastplate was the heaviest piece of armor. That the soldier wore. In fact, it was common for a breastplate to weigh about 40 pounds. In fact, that's probably the average. When they averaged, or when they came in and they measured you from the top of your shoulder, the top of your knee, the size of your shoulders, the size of your belly, and they gave this to you, the average weight was 40 pounds. But a breastplate could weigh up to 75 pounds. If you were a big guy and you had big shoulders and a big belly, I want you to understand to be properly clothed with that breastplate, it could weigh as much as 75 pounds. And believe it or not, the Bible says that Goliath's breastplate weighed 125 pounds. Did you know that? Yeah, look at 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 5. Notice what it says. He wore a bronze helmet, and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. How many of you lift weights? An Olympic bar with spin collars. I don't even know if they use spin collars anymore. Weighs 45 pounds. You put two 45s on it. You now have 135 pounds. It would be like taking an Olympic bar with two 45-pound plates on each side. And that is your breastplate. That's how much his breastplate weighed. Now, of course, the weight of the breastplate actually slowed the soldier. He wasn't as fast with it. But people, it was worth the sacrifice because it protected all the vital organs. In fact, the word breastplate is translated from the Greek word thorax. And as you might have guessed, our English word thorax is actually transliterated from this Greek word. Now, the word thorax refers to the area between the neck and the waist, or what we would call the chest cavity. That's why a surgeon who does open heart surgery is called a thoracic surgeon. Why is he called a thoracic surgeon? Because he operates in the chest cavity, the thorax. But my point is this. The breastplate was designed to protect the heart. And people, the same holds true when it comes to the armor of God. The breastplate is designed to protect your heart. Not physically, 
but spiritually. In fact, turn to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, and I'll show you something interesting. Notice what it says. In fact, this is one of my favorite verses, and Lisa and I have talked about this many times. If I could go back and raise my children again, they would memorize Proverbs 4, 23, and I would have them either memorize it in the NIV or the NLT because it uses the word guard, but that's what the original Hebrew means. Notice what this says. Guard your heart above all else. Wow. Guard your heart above all else. For it determines the course of your life. Now, do you see that last part? For it, talking about the heart, determines the course of your life. In other words, it determines what you're going to do, what you're going to say, or how you're going to act. It determines whether you're good or bad, whether you're sweet and kind or mean and nasty. It determines whether you're positive or negative. It determines whether you forgive or you hold a grudge and become bitter. It determines whether you're merciful or judgmental. So it truly does determine the course of your life. And people, that's why we're supposed to guard it. We're supposed to protect it. But how do you protect it? Well, we guard our heart by putting on the breastplate of righteousness. And we keep the breastplate on by walking in the word of God and doing what it says. Because as long as the loin belt of truth is on, it's impossible to take the breastplate off. But that's also why the devil wants you out of the word of God. That's also why he wants you so busy. That's also why when you're tempted with something, you don't want to read the word of God that tells you you shouldn't be doing that. And he tells you, don't read that. And he wants you to justify it. Because if you'll stop with the word of God, then the breastplate can come off and your heart is no longer protected. People, do you want to know why so many Christian leaders have fallen? Do you want to know why there are so many moral failures within the church? It's because they didn't guard their heart. To be honest with you, I'm surprised that there's not more Christian leaders who have fallen or committed moral lapses. Truly. Because you'd be surprised the number of pastors who don't walk in the Word of God. And once you take off the Word of God, once you're not walking, you no longer have the loin belt of truth on. I want you to understand something. We sometimes picture the devil and these demons as coming out and physically assaulting us from the outside. And that happens many times. But I talked about the way that they attacked you, and that's through temptation. That's through temptation. And what they want to do is they want to injure your heart. They want your heart to go from being pure and innocent to dirty and filthy. That's how they damage your heart. Listen to me. I don't watch movies with nudity in it. I don't care what our culture is like. Listen to me. Nudity in movies is pornography. It comes from the word pornea in Greek, and the Bible talks about that, calls it filthiness. Let me explain something to you. Your nakedness is for your spouse, and their nakedness is for you. It's not for anyone else. And I don't care if it's just a little part in the movie. When Lisa and I get ready to go see a movie, we go to IMDB, IDB something. She does it, I make her do it. I don't do it. And then it tells you that there's nudity in it. Tells you how many curse words are in it, all of those things. But I don't watch movies with nudity in it. I don't sit up, set up meetings with people of the opposite sex. I've had people leave our church, especially women, they get upset. I can't get in to see Pastor Allen. You can get in to see Pastor Lisa, but they don't want to see Pastor Lisa. They want to see me. They're not too bright. You want to know why? You want to know who the leader of the church is, the real leader of the church? It's Lisa. I might put on the pants, but she zips them. You want to know who's leading this church? Here's how it goes. Of course, we're talking spiritually. God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, Lisa, Shirley, 
talent. Yeah. And if, if you want to see me and you're a woman, you're not going to get to. And I'm sorry if you're going to leave church. Go ahead and leave. Go find a church that doesn't practice the Word of God. I tell everyone in that's on staff, all my men, you don't meet with the opposite sex. Ever. Now, you get in to see Lisa and she can't help you. You know what she'll do? She'll set up a meeting with me, but she sits in on that meeting. So you're there, I'm here, and Lisa's right there. She says, Pastor, they came in to see me, blah, 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 blah. Well, she doesn't call me Pastor. Other people call me Pastor. She calls me Honey, but anyways. <laughs> but that's the way we do it. I don't meet with members of the opposite sex. I have clear-cut boundaries when it comes to members of the opposite sex, and I lay that down for those who are on my staff. If they don't follow it, they're setting themselves up, and many have fallen because of that. I don't get on the computer late at night when everyone else is in bed. Why? Because I'm a man. And all men with normal levels of testosterone are stimulated by their eyesight. Pornography will always be a temptation. So there are certain things that I do and it's called boundaries. I did a series on boundaries. You don't set the boundary right on the line. Everyone wants to know what is that line? Honey, in the, if you ever drive down a road, here's what you'll notice. They'll have guardrails up, but the guardrails are not where it's dangerous. Normally, there's more off to the side of the road before it gets dangerous. They put it in a safe place. Because if you hit that guardrail, they don't want you going off the cliff. So it's not right on the cliff. It's over. So I put in these guardrails. I purposely, intentionally guard my heart because I know it determines the course of my life. I know that everything I do flows from my heart. I know that a good tree cannot produce evil fruit and an evil tree cannot produce good fruit. Whatever is in my heart, that's where the issues of life flow from. I have to protect that. Because eventually what's in my heart will manifest itself. You can hide it from others for a while. But it will come out. Think of it like this. When you first start dating someone, you put your, fur, your best foot forward. You open the door for that lady. You pull out the chair for her. You don't pass gas in her presence. No. That happens after you're pretty sure she's yours. <laughs> We're like that. We do the same thing in our spiritual life. We put our best foot forward in front of others, but pretty soon, I want you to understand something. Eventually, what's in your heart will manifest itself. Now, listen to me. I'm not talking to a non-Christian. I'm not talking to someone who's not received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Because they're a sinner, and God gives mercy and grace. Jesus didn't die for us after we cleaned ourselves up. The Bible says, why were we yet sinners? Christ loved us and gave himself for us. In other words, Christ died for us. Why were we were yet sinners? We don't clean up before we come to God through Jesus Christ. We come to Jesus Christ first, and then he cleans us up. The problem is, and this is what most of you don't understand, because most of you have been Christians a long time. The Bible no longer refers to you as a sinner if you've accepted Jesus Christ. The Bible refers to you as a saint, and nothing is worse than a sinning saint. Nothing is worse than a sinning saint. And you want to know why you have problems? You want to know why you haven't grown? I'll tell you why. First, first with that loin belt. You start getting in the word of God. You start getting in the meat of the word. And pretty soon, you're no longer conformed to this world, but you're transformed by the renewing of your mind that you're able to prove. That word means to make a distinction. You're able to distinguish between the good will, the acceptable will, and the perfect will of God. You start knowing what it is to be righteous and what you should be doing. You know, when you first get saved, you know, oh man, I can't smoke anymore. I'm not saying you can't do that. You can still do that if you want to, but your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. You shouldn't be doing that. But if I'm going to say that, I should also say this. You shouldn't have the sin of gluttony either. You shouldn't be over. And so the Lord's really convicted me on that. But anyways, you, know, you, start, you start hopefully getting drunk. You stop doing things with the opposite sex you shouldn't be doing. And you start doing the major things. But as you begin to grow in the Lord, God starts coming in. Now he's dealing with the things of the heart. He starts dealing with your attitude. He starts dealing with the little things. You know, with murmuring, complaining, gossiping. And the more you get in the word of God, all of a sudden you don't realize it. But you're starting to walk in the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That breastplate automatically comes on. Remember? 
It's a genitive of source, which means it owes its existence to it. So when you start walking in the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, the, the, the breastplate automatically comes on. And because you're walking in the Word, that loin belt's automatically on and it's in place. And as long as you stay in the Word, as soon as you make a mistake, let me tell you what happens. The Holy Spirit convicts you. When it convicts you, guess what you do? Oh, God, forgive me of that. And you start right again walking in the Word of God and doing what it says. Now, let me tell you, what you're doing is protecting your heart. But when you stop walking in the Word of God, when you stop doing what God's Word says, your loin belt's off, your breastplate goes off, and your heart is unprotected. And you're going to fall eventually. Let's hope it's not a, a fall that will affect your family, affect others, but you will fall. And this is why if you want to be able to withstand the wiles of the devil then you have to put on the whole armor of God.